Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Woody Guthrie and the Dust Bowl Ballads, a graphic novel by Nick Hayes. I was recently gifted this book by um, my dear friends, and I never heard of it, never heard of Nick Hayes. It's a library edition, they got it at a thrift store. So it was, uh, the spine's a little wonky. But it's from Abrams Comics Art, their line of graphic novels and comic-related publications. So, it, you know, it took me a few months to crack it open. I had other stuff to read, and I read it the past couple of days. This thing's terrific. This Nick Hayes guy, never heard of him, never seen his work. Really amazing writer. There's some amazing passages, passages, well-written passages in this book. And... um I guess it turns out he's uh, an English political cartoonist. He works for The Guardian and The New Statesman. I think he's even won some, like, journalism awards for his political cartoons. But in the teens, he became a graphic novelist. And this is his second one. And it's really good. I really enjoyed this. Let's crack it open. Let's see, discard... I guess it was read a little too, read too much. Also by Nick Hayes, The Rhyme of the Modern Mariner. That's his first graphic novel. So we start off, we're in uh, Okama, this town in Oklahoma. And I, I want to give you a flavor of the the writing here. He uses all this amazing dialect and slang from that time. This is this is before the Depression, so it's the 20s. We see these three kids looking at the... They're near the junkyard. And uh, Woody Guthrie's in the junkyard just pounding on a tin can with some spoons, making a racket. So these three kids are saying, So Pa upped our sticks and sent us on the move and go again. And we followed that boom up, boom up the highway, and we got ourselves here. Well, you can't be in our gang. We got more new fellers than a corner of spiders' eggs. Schools crammed, gangs rammed. There's more boom than room in this old town. What is that noise? And we find out that Woody Guthrie's a young teenager who's dropped out of school. And he's kind of got fer feral. <laughs> he's just like... Gets scrap metal every day. He's let his hair go, get all woolly and nappy and matted. And he walks around in bare feet. And he kind of talks like a crazy person. He's always just like spouting nonsense. But always kind of like funny nonsense, you know? He tells the kids, I quit learning for earning. So basically, Okama is a boom town. They discovered oil. It's already been a wheat, a very big wheat producing area. So uh, there's a lot of people in the streets. A lot of people just moved to town to uh, take advantage of the boom. And he talks about what a boom town's like. He, it's a, the book has lots of. Uh, it's just very historical, like just giving you a flavor for the times. Um, you know, later on when the Depression comes, just all the towns he visits, it really like paints a really vivid scene of all these various cities um, going through various uh, boom and bust periods. He's got a really good sense of language and a good eye for detail. And one day he's roaming around and he hears his first harmonica. It's this uh, shoeshine boy. And he's just entranced by it, the sound of it. He actually get, he becomes a shoeshine boy and hangs out with this other guy. And he lets him use his harmonica so he gets better and better at it. Saves up all of his money to buy his first harmonica. He lives with this old lady in like a little shack. Um, 
She's kind of a character. People say she's halfway between cuckoo and kooky. <laughs> Uh, Woody Guthrie says that she was the kind of woman that would have been burned at the stake as a witch 200 years ago. Because she's just odd, you know. Mrs. Atkins is her name. He describes more about Okama and the drilling stations. Uh, but Okama's already getting tapped out. At least the rumors are starting. So people are starting to drift away. The boom is slightly over. And the way he even just describes the sound of a harmonica. The little bending you do with a harmonica, you know? Uh, that, that little... Uh, he calls it the depression of the note. And he hears, uh, it reminds him of his mother. We'll find out more about her later. So one day he gets a letter from his father, who's in the Texas town of Pampa. And he says, son, I've got myself a little job and I can get you hired here. I want you to come back and live with me. I want us to be a family again. So he does. He talks about his father. His father was kind of a bigwig around these parts when he was a younger man. Not only was he a good businessman, he was also a really good boxer. <laughs> and so he had a, he was brains and brawn. But his hands had become arthritic. He had lost a lot of his uh, money and his land. He was a big landowner. And we find out a little a bit more about his mother. Apparently, his mother went crazy at some point. And the reason why he's not with her is like, she, he was asleep taking a nap one day and she threw like coal oil on him to try to burn him. Luckily, he wasn't killed. He was injured pretty bad. So uh, Woody's two youngest, uh, his brother and sister were shipped off to... Uh, their aunt's place. And uh, the father went a few weeks later after he could uh, travel. The mother was shipped off to a insane asylum. Because this wasn't the first time she did something crazy. It's been building. Woody's older brother, Rory, sold the house. And so basically the family was scattered. And so that's when Woody went feral and moved to Okama and moved in with Mrs. Atkins. He seemed to take a pride in being an outcast, sneering at all the townsfolk who, you know, looked down at him. He'd sing these body songs in the street just to offend them. So the father comes pick him up. He comes to pick him up and they go to Pampa. This is pretty nice here. A lot of this art reminds me of like, I don't know, it's it's way more cartoony and it's not woodcut style, but it reminds me of that art style, like Franz Bazerol and Lynn Ward. It, uh, and um, Nick Hayes is a very political artist and it seems like, yeah, he probably definitely took influence from those because a lot of those had a strong social message. There's so much, so many passages that, like the captions, just like explain little things about the world, about the country at the time. Really, really well written too. It's just like ni all these nice little asides. It's almost like you learn all this little bit of like history and sociology and nature just from Woody's musings that have nothing to do with the actual plot. I wish I could read more of this to you. But it's a big graphic novel. We gotta, we gotta get going. What do you see? Things like there's so much wheat that they're they're letting it rot, so the price will go up. There's just too much wheat, so the price is too cheap. So they're just letting it rot. And so what do you see? All these things that are just 
kind of changing him. He's just like, you know, there's something wrong with this uh, system. So Pampa's having its own boom. They're like the the wheat grower of America, the big wheat production place. <coughs> he gets a, another, a second job working for this guy who uh, basically has an illegal saloon. It's supposedly a drugstore, but there's a bar there and everyone comes to get drunk. I like moonshine. It sounds terrible, the, the booze he serves. Like it would make you go blind, you know? He starts hanging out with his uncle Jeff, who's the musician in the family, and his wife Aileen. She plays melodeon, and uh, he really, the way he describes how music is so transcendent, especially when you're like dirt poor. Nikki is really uh, has these beautiful, uh, almost revelries, like just describing playing music together, how it brings people together. Woody starts getting better at his guitar. Starts playing at the bar where he works. But he finds that he realizes that so many people come there not just to, you know, kick back after work. They they come there to get, to find oblivion. Because it de even though it's a boom town, these are all the victims of a boom town. They, they haven't made it. They're uh, saddled with huge debts. And they just can't climb out. But it's a good time for him in his life. He's learning all about music from other musicians, from uh, the tribal stomp of the Indians, the lonesome lament, laments of the cowboys, and the soaring fiddle reels of Appalachia. He talks about just how society was then. People would just get together all the time, have potlucks, share food, share music. Everyone would sit around with their own instruments and just trade songs back and forth. And Woody loves it. Woody loves everything about it. But then the depression hits. I guess um, I never knew this, but I guess it took a year or two for the depression to really be felt in this part of the country. Um, the big cities felt it first. and uh, But things were pretty much the same. Pampa for little... So Woody's still having a great time learning about music. and He starts a little band. The Corn Cob Trio. With these two guys he knows. And they, uh, they do pretty well. He shows the rest of the country the soup lines and the bread lines and the Hoovervilles. People getting uh, displaced from their homes. So the depression is getting big. So one of the guys he plays with has got a sister who comes to all of his shows. The whole family does. Oh, they're playing in a nice rink. And Woody takes a liking to her. Her name's Mary. So, uh... He gets word that his mother died. He has a flashback to when he visited her at the mental hospital and she was just cold and uh, pretty much lost in her own mind. She's uh, She was gone. So Pamba's, uh, the depression is hitting. Um, everyone's out of work, the streets are deserted. It's becoming a ghost town already. Even though people are still living there. They're the ghosts. So it's around this time that uh, his uncle suggested a weird trip that they all take. Apparently they had this, uh, Woody's grandfather had a place down in Mexico. And he found a thick vein of silver in a rock one day. But he didn't, you know, I, I think he had other business to go uh, deal with. So he never really exploited this. But he kept the map, a really crude map, in his wallet for years. And supposedly, he put that, uh, he 
uh, put that silver rock under a certain root. And so they all, uh, the father and the uncle decide, well, let's go down there and search for that. And so Woody and his brother and his uncle and his father, they take a big road trip. I think it's, I believe it's called the Chisos Mountains. Let me see real quick. I will find out. And this seems to be a very transcendent experience for Woody. Just being out, um, you know, he, his whole life he's grown up in like, you know, near oil derricks and spilling smoke into the sky. Um, spewing smoke into the sky, I should say. And this is his first time just like in the serenity of nature and he really has a connection with it. He also loves just sitting around the campfire, singing old songs with his family. He says that he felt like a family once again for the first time in a while. They really bonded them. They can't find the rock. So they come back. Pampa's even worse off. The dust storms have already started. There's a, just everything's covered in a veil of dust. The people in the town have this desperation about him. But his band is still getting gigs. And they're still having a good time. <clears throat> this page is, uh, this sequence is really well written. It's showing that they're playing this barn dance. And, you know, the, everyone comes in. Nobody's, everyone's covered in dust. Every time the door opens, it's almost like their their harsh reality this flows in the door. So everyone's pretty subdued. But then through the all various bands playing, the old pu well, the old timers start dancing and everyone gets into it. And it's just this like six, eight page sequence of just the the rapturous feeling of community and uh just the joy of surviving, even though things aren't good. How music can help you get through the rough patches. And everyone just gets happy. And Woody's the corncob trio play, and everyone goes crazy. It's kind of interesting the way the off registered shading, and it just looks like, you know, like a good time. And through it all, Mary is looking up at him. He's definitely uh, taking a liking to this one. So they get married, and uh, they move into a little shack. It's not much, but they love each other. So it, it, the house is warmed with their new love. But things are getting worse in Pampa. The dust storms are there every day. Woody still ekes out in existence. He gets little jobs. He becomes a magician's assistant with his uncle. His uncle, I guess, does magic. So he has, he's surviving. I'm sorry, we also have a, it's very important in this book how there's always flashbacks to his mother. Because uh, his mother is just was such a big figure in his life and to see her degenerate and become, you know, insane. It has really uh, kind of traumatized him. His father remarries this woman, a mail order bride, who's a spiritualist. She uh, reads palms and does all that stuff. Woody kind of has an interest in, uh, finds himself uh, reading up on all that stuff. And he just starts reading about everything. He goes to the library almost every day. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm parched. And then uh, I like this image of him flying on the wing with uh, book wings. I've never seen that image. It seems so obvious. But I've never seen anyone use that visual metaphor. So um, he has this huge, like, um, fantasy where, you know, with his uh, book wings, he's seeing the planes, you know, millions of years ago. And they were just being formed. 
He sees the mastodons and the saber-toothed tigers that used to roam that part of the world. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, he sees it when it's an inland sea. I guess uh, the middle of North America, or the United States was underwater. It was a big sea at one time. And just time passes, he sees everything. He sees the, you know, the mastodons fade away. And then, uh, I guess a big part of the plains, I never knew about this, was the buffalo grass that grew there. I don't know if you guys ever gardened, but there's some of those roots that are all like tangled and intertwined, almost like a woven mat. It sucks if you're a gardener and you have to deal with that shit. But that's what kept the plains from blowing away for thousands of years. And it's part of the strength of the plains, you know? It held it all together. These strong roots. He says the Native Americans... He says the conquistadors come and exploit and kill the Native Americans and kick them off their land. He sees the white man come and exploit the land. And then um, this is when we found out why that buffalo grass was so important. I guess in the early part of the 20th century, the settlers tore up all that buffalo grass so they could grow wheat wheat was the cash crop and wheat uh, couldn't grow in that so they tear all those roots that kept the the dirt from blowing off in the wind and the strong winds of the midwest they it was all gone and once these uh dust storms happened they just grew and grew the earth you know was just blown away And there was a drought. It was just a bad time all around. He remembers his mom again, how she could be so happy and then a change would come on her all of a sudden. She'd get in this morose, sullen state. Those states seemed to be happen more and more as she grew older. He talks more about songs. His mother used to sing these old Scotch ballads, Scots ballads and Irish laments. And they were really important to him. People start hitting the road. The Okies. It's just like nothing. Pampa's just a shithole. But when he's still there with Mary's wife and their new kid... This art is, uh, I haven't really talked about it much, but uh, it, it seems very computer generated to me. And um, I don't know, when I first looked at it, it just seemed like, I don't know if I'm gonna like this, like this kind of cartoony art, but it definitely works with the, the writing. As I started reading it, I was like, yeah, this is perfectly fine. Um, the lettering is very interesting, all of the captions, are, I, I don't know if you can see this font, but it's like a, um, a doubled up lettering. It looks very old timey, but then almost all the dialogue is all this kind of script, long hand. So there's this really bad dust storm. Look at that, I like this here, very expressive. And he does stuff like this. I really like his like crazy backgrounds. This crazy woman ranting how it's the judgment of God in the middle of this dust storm. It really makes it seem like how horrible dust storms were. Like you can barely breathe. It's just, it's just dirt in your mouth. So he makes it home to Mary and they sit out the storm. Thinks about his mother again and the songs she used to sing. And Woody uh, 
takes an old song and writes new lyrics to it. He writes a song about the dust storm that just happened. Because his mom used to sing this song about a, a cyclone. So uh, it comes to his head as some as comfort. And he decides to rewrite the lyrics. So this is like one of the first times Woody starts writing more and more lyrics. Adding new lyrics to old songs at first. And then writing his own songs. So when the dust storm is over, look at this. It's just like a post-apocalyptic landscape. There's just uh, dunes of dirt. Half burying houses and cars. A train was derailed. All the cows are dead. Ancient Indian burial mounds have been unearthed. That's how much uh, soil was uh, blown away into the sky. So Woody's writing more and more. More and more people are leaving Pampa, putting all their possessions in a car and heading to California. Woody's starting to envy them. He's starting to get some wanderlust. Him and his dad both lose their jobs. Things are getting really bad in Pampa. Oh, I'm sorry. They just have a baby now. But Woody's got this funk. He's in a funk. Even the birth of his daughter doesn't really uh, break him out of it. Yeah, I guess the reason why I'm um, kind of a uh, fair to middling about the artist, like certain people are drawn really, I don't know, just it doesn't look good. <laughs> I like the way he draws Woody, though. But as I was reading it, it didn't bother me. I was just like so into the writing and the story. So Woody just takes off to see his father. His father's in a bad way. He's going to go back to Okama to visit his dad. I'm sorry, or he's going back to Pampa. He's in Okama with his wife. Nope, he's going to Okama. Sorry about that. He hitches a ride. He sees all of the Hoover towns, the Hoovervilles, and the, the shanty towns. And it's, it's pretty uh, bleak out there. He finds his dad in a bar. And uh, when he first sees him, he has to like hold back the urge to cry. To seeing his father just such a you know, he was such a great man at one point. And they get in this really interesting discussion. Uh, his father's just talking about, you know, the, the settlers of the land and the wheat, the gold of the land, and how they got all these people to move there. Basically, almost everyone who moved there was lied to. All these handbills were distributed out east. Saying, ah, oh, we got all this land here. It's, it's become your own settler. And there's nothing there. They told him it was this bustling town. There literally was nothing. And um, Woody's getting distracted by the song on the radio. It's really very music orientated. So he uh, basically schools Woody about the whole, how this town started and how the land won't give up anymore. And when you've turned that land into gold and turned that gold into dollar bills and when you ain't got no more dollars, you don't got nothing. And then America don't want to know you. So I think Woody gets a lot of his uh, outlook on life from his dad. Kind of cynical. Kind of knowing that, like, the poor are always going to get fucked and the rich are always going to do the fucking. So everything's pretty bad there in Okama. 
So he heads back home to Mary. He only lasted a month with Mary though. Not that they broke up or anything, but he just, he had this wanderlust. He wanted to get on the road. He started coming home drunk from all of his gigs. Uh, he's still writing songs, but things are not good between him and Mary. He's just disgusted with Pampa. It's basically a ghost town. On its, well, it's on its way to becoming one. So he takes off. And he gets, he jumps a train. And he goes, he gets off in Tucson, Arizona. And he finds out, you know, Tucson, I guess, is doing okay at this time. So the cops there are just hassling any tramp they see. It's like, you should move along. We don't want your kind here. When he uh, tries to get work, or just basically tries to get some food. He's like, hey, I'll do some, uh. Household work for anyone here. If you could be a bowl of chili. Everyone's turning him down. He has a run-in with this priest. This sanctimonious priest. Who won't give him any food. Very unchrist like But he does find this old couple who own a diner. And uh, he uh, basically just... They, they say, yeah, if you mop our floor and take out the trash, we'll feed you. And I like this, how showing how nice these people are. When uh, Woody's alone with the the mother, the wife, she says, don't tell the old man, but here's a bag of sandwiches for the road. <laughs> and a second later, when Woody's alone with the husband, he says, hey, don't tell the wife. Things are pretty tight right now. Here's a quarter. Maybe this will help you down the road. So uh, it's nice to see in these desperate times, still people are very kind, can be kind. So Woody's got to catch another train. He's got to avoid the railroad bulls. They would just hang off the trains with uh, baseball bats and pipes, ready to beat the shit out of uh, any hobos jumping the train. But you could avoid them and get on the train. And then we have this another long interlude where uh, Woody's on the train with all these other guys. All of them have, uh, you know, failed the American dream. They're all losers. And uh, once again, Woody pulls out his harmonica. Someone's got a guitar. Oh, it's Woody's guitar. He bars. Someone bars Woody's guitar, and they all start singing songs. And even though these guys are just, a, they're not in a very good place, they all start singing along. And once again, we see the community of song, you know, how it brings people together. Because that was Woody's whole life, basically. You know, uh, that was all of his most joyous thing was, you know, bringing music to people, playing in front of people. And uh, with his language, he really describes the, the warm feeling between these total strangers that music brings. I know it sounds corny the way I'm describing it, but it's actually not. When you read uh, Nick Hayes' great writing. Talking about how each song represents, you know, every type of person. Each song had risen to the present moment from the dark waters of the past. Something about these songs contained a truth, a way of seeing the world that chimed through the present as it had through the past. And we see uh, this description of this actual song, Gypsy Davy. I guess it's some old folk song that Woody plays. And they start arguing about like some Scotchman, Scots guy says, that's actually an old song. They changed the words for America. So we see this lineage, how these songs just keep going and going through centuries. And, uh, they're still relevant today in a metaphorical way. So he makes it to California. Luckily, he has an aunt who lives in Turlock. And she totally takes him in, bathes him. And he sleeps for days. He's so exhausted. And then we meet his, uh, his cousin Jack. This flashy guy. This is the area of the singing cowboy in film. 
So he's made this whole act where he dresses up like a cowboy and sings these syrupy ballads. And he plays at various places in town and all the girls swoon. Because he's, he's a very charismatic, uh, good-looking guy. He's got a joie de vivre. So he, um, he starts an act with uh, Woody. They kind of become this duo. Woody, Woody's kind of like the clown of the act. He uh, tells jokes and stuff and plays the washboard. And then Jack uh, gets all the uh, women in the crowd. Dewey. So I guess Jack had an eye for this girl uh, of the Chrisman family. And Woody and Jack would hang out with them almost every uh, weekend. And they all were, they were a music, musical family. And they would all basically jam together on the porch. And uh, Woody was uh, discovered that uh, Maxine, the eldest sister, she was a, they harmonized really well. And so he really uh, loved these visits to the Christmas. Pretty soon, it's almost like he moves in with the Christmas. He's almost like a fixture there. He's there almost every day, playing music, hanging out, writing his songs. And the Christmas seem to, have, they have adopted him. They seem to like him. And Woody uh, continues to harmonize with Maxine. So, uh, Woody's still writing songs. We see some of them illustrated. A lot of his songs are like funny. He even just describes them as almost like an animated cartoon. Like when people hear them, it's almost like seeing a fun, crazy cartoon. And so he draws it as such. It's very daffy looking. Little merry melodies. And so Woody and uh, Jack get more popular. They get a radio show. This is a radio station is owned by a socialist guy, but he looks pretty rich. He's a cigar chomping, rich looking dude, but I guess he's a socialist. And uh, Marge, I'm sorry, Maxine, starts appearing on the show after Jack uh, kind of quits. Jack has got to get back to feeding his family and go do a real job. And they become quite popular. So uh, his socialist boss has this idea. He's like, you know, you're, I like your corn pone philosophizing that you do on the radio. I think it would be great if you went on this road trip to all of the Hoover towns, Hoovervilles, and the shanty towns, and kind of did a report. I mean, he used to live in those things, and he, he's familiar with them. He feels kind of like a tourist, because he is. He's doing pretty well right now. He's actually doing okay financially. But he decides to go on it. And the people there don't uh, treat him like an outsider. They recognize like he's a kindred spirit. And Woody uh, just hanging out with these people is kind of getting more radicalized. He's really starting to see America as a kind of a sham. How just uh, the, the rich people, the banker men, the landowners, they're the croupiers in this casino and uh, the house always wins. And all of his friends and all these poor people, they're just the marks. So he, he finally sends for Mary to come out to visit him, to come out to live with him, him and his baby. He doesn't even have a place for her to stay. He actually forgets to meet her at the station. And then as soon as she get there, she gets there. He says, Oh, I gotta I gotta leave LA for a few months. I got a job. So of course it's like their relationship is so bad. They just are, are arguing constantly. Woody's just absent. He seems, seems like a really bad guy when it comes to his uh relationship with his wife. 
So he's doing uh, more of that uh, touring the, the shanty towns, playing music for the people. And he's staying in one shanty town, one Hooverville, and a fire breaks out. Well, it was probably planned. Apparently, this would happen a lot. The the good townspeople of these towns, they didn't like these shanty towns, as you can imagine. And they would just burn them down. Sometimes the cops would just come in and beat the shit out of everyone. I mean, they were really treating them poorly. So uh, I think that everyone escapes the fire with no casualties, but all of their possessions are burned, their little shacks. And as Woody is uh, watching the fire from the hilltop, by the way, I really like this design motif of the flames. He, re he remembers his mom once again. And that's pretty much when his mom lost it. There was a fire in their house in uh, Okaba. And that basically they all survived. But Woody's mom, after that, that's when it all started happening. That's when her nerves started to fray and shred. And then his sister, she was, she got a, um, she got burned. Um, she had went through, she actually died. She burned to death. So fire to Woody obviously is this very big thing in his life. So he's reminiscing about all the things in his life that have been scorched by fire. He describes fire as a vengeful curse on his family. It spoke of total upheaval to him. So the next morning, he, you know, all night he walked away from that place. He walked through the night and ends up in this beautiful little glade. And uh, I guess he jumped a fence into this almond orchard to get out of the wind. And he starts thinking about how this, these fences you know, these, these are, this is the crime, not breaking f f through a fence, not trespassing. The real crime is putting up these fences that divide our country and mark it off into little lots. This land was his land as much as the next man's. The ungodly sin was the fence, not the crossing of it. So after he returned from his uh, tour of the camps, Mary's uh, announces she's going home. She's going back to Pampa or Okama, one of those places. She misses her home. And uh, Woody doesn't really even care. He's like, fine. He's done with her, it sounds like. He doesn't realize, though, that she has a, a second child in her belly. So he kind of becomes this um, celebrity in left-wing circles. You know, the radio owner, radio station owner where he works, he does all these other big wigs in the uh, Communist Party and all that stuff, and unions. So he starts, like, touring with these two other guys. Playing these rallies, Democratic Party rallies, worker strikes... Communist Party meetings. I like this. He says, uh, he says, my name is Woody Guthrie. I ain't a communist necessarily, but I've been in the red all my life. So he always has that like corn pone philosophy, as he calls it. A little humor. So when he realizes that Mary has a second baby in her, he, ha he hitches back. He hitches back home to be with her. He knows he has to. It is Pampa. Okay. The town is really post-apocalyptic now. There's barely anyone left. Everything's closed down. Almost everything. The The dust is still everywhere. It's nuts. 
so there's obviously things have changed for the worse. There's just a chill in the air between the two in their little shack. Neither of them are happy. When Woody gets a letter offering him work in New York City, they both knew this was the end. And even though deep down she doesn't want him to go, she was like, yeah, you better go. Mary was willing Woody to leave and yearning for him to stay. She was pushing at his back and tugging at his sleeve. One day he's in a diner, though, on his way there, and he hears Kate Smith. She was a big singer of her day, very stout patriot. And she uh, made, had a big hit with the song God Bless America, which is like a total patriot song. Like, uh, America's better than everyone. Praise God. And it sticks in Woody's craw. It's like a shard in his brain. As he's hitching to New York City, he's just like, what a bunch of, what a load of bullshit. And he starts coming up with something in his head. He uh, starts thinking of a, a parody of it. But we'll get to that in one second. We have another, while he falls asleep in this one train car, we have another flashback to the Chisos Mountains. And kind of reiterates what a lot of stuff he talked about in the last uh, flashback. How just he loved being amongst nature. And he just felt in harmony for the first time in his life. So it's, it's kind of a weird uh, narrative uh, choice, I thought, to like come back to Chisos. And kind of reiterate everything that happened the first time. I mean, it's different. We see other incidences in that trip. But it seems like a lot of the musings that Woody has while he's on that trip it's kind of, are kind of repeated. Yeah, I like his use of language a lot. They eat in silence, eyes lost in the stars that perforated the vast blackness. It was as if space had stooped to touch the ground. I should have mentioned this is a fiction based on Woody Guthrie's life. It says, so I mean, I'd, uh, a lot of this could just be Nick Hayes just uh, extrapolating on what he knows of Woody Guthrie. But he obviously researched him and a lot of the incidences happened in his life. But all of these like musings, you know, we don't know if Woody Guthrie sat in a field and thought all, all this stuff. There's another page of him connecting with nature. He's in rapture, it looks like. Singing, harmonizing with all of the sounds of nature. Kind of an interesting uh, spread of typography, different lettering styles. He meets a Native American in the desert. And when he comes back to the campfire, you know, they all have this uh, heavy discussion about uh, owning land and who, who has the right to own land. Does anyone? Apparently, that's a big thing. Nick Hayes is obviously bringing that to the table. I guess he's part of this mo movement in England where it's almost like pro-trespassing. Almost like public land should be public. Nobody should own all this land. And so he actually does these things where he'll trespass and, uh, you know, to protest all of these, uh, everything being fenced in and owned by someone. And so while his train is continuing in New York, he's thinking about this parody song of God Bless America. And he's thinking about how all of these people have been dicked over in this uh, rigged game. He, thinking about the song, God Bless America, the words were stiff, an oath of allegiance that boxed its listeners into its doctrine. 
The couplets were tight fence lines that rolled out over the airwaves and ruled lines around the minds that heard them. These lines were lies bought and sold by the people on the inside. So in the original version, it's pretty much the same lyrics, but every line would end with God blessed America for me to make it more of like a direct parody of that song. So he's working on the song the whole journey and thinking about, you know, all the stuff, like I just said. And we see more and more verses from This Land is Our Land. He makes it to New York City and his buddy's waiting for him. Uh, I think this is the guy he went on the road with, uh, going to all those uh, lefty things. And one night he stays up all night. He's uh, finishing up the song. And when the dawn finally cracked the dark horizon, the words came as if they had always been so. This land was made for you and me. The end. I, I think that's kind of neat how he just ends it with like him just writing his most famous song. And then obviously there could be a second book about his, you know, fame and because then basically this land is, was made for you and me kind of became the unofficial national anthem of America. I forgot, like we used to sing that in school, but I didn't know this when I was a kid. The fourth and the sixth verse, they cut out because that's the like the commie stuff, the, the socialist stuff. And then we have a little end information. So I got to say, guys, I'm pleasantly surprised by this book. I thought it was going to be one of those, you know, New York Times bestseller graphic novels that are important. You're like, you know, after like since Fun Home came out and uh, Persepolis. There's so many graphic novels out there that are just like, oh, a moving story about whatever. It's almost like those uh, Oscar bait movies. They're always very important and serious. And I just thought, oh, you're going to make a bio of Woody Guthrie to get on the New York Times. But this is written really well. And, um, and you know, the art's interesting. <laughs> I wouldn't... I don't know if it's the best art ever, but definitely some panels really kind of impressed me. But, you know, this is a huge graphic novel. <laughs> it must have been hard to keep up your uh, strength. I mean, I think this thing's over 200 pages. So that's a lot of drawn. So maybe I should cut him some slack, but I won't. <laughs> it's not the best art. But amazing writing. I loved reading this. Totally enjoyed it. So, uh... I'm sure you could find this at a Goodwill or something or a remainder bin. I don't know. It says New York Times bestselling, but I never even heard of this and never heard, read a review of it. But it's pretty good. It's a good read. And uh, it's definitely going to remain in the Academy. It's, it's definitely worthy. So uh, I guess that's it for today's video. And I'll see you here next time at the Hercules Pettix Academy of Comic Book Studies.